thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And uh, welcome to the world as run by women. Yes. Ah, but is the Femtopia a good idea? That's what we'll be asking uh, today. It's a big moment. Uh, tomorrow, Americans are going to vote in what is arguably uh, the most important, divisive, memorable election of their and maybe our lifetimes. Um, so on the eve of finding out if the country is going to elect its first female president, we are here. The poll wanted to have a uh, frank and uh, fascinating, hopefully, discussion about what the world will look like, would look like, um, as more and more women achieve positions of power. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, with the, the, the broadest question. What would the world look like if, if there were more women leaders in it? Would it be different, and if so, how? Karen, increasing diversity is very important to you in your work. Let's kind of wind this back a bit. Why is that? Why is diversity a good thing if that isn't, doesn't sound like a ridiculous question? Um, it's good for business. It's as simple as that. So when you look at future consumers and existing consumers, 83% um, of all purchases are made by women. 60% um, of all car purchases are made by women. 55% of all computer purchases are made by women. And the last two categories are categories which historically people thought were very male dominated. So purchasing power of the UK and globally is very female based. Um, so it is good business sense to actually future proof your business and start looking at your audience that you have to build a relationship with pretty good idea to have some of that audience inter inside your organisation to mm. help do that. I completely agree with Karen and then some, you know, I would add as someone who's started businesses or organisations, if you look at entrepreneurial activity, there's still this massive disparity and it's a funny thing, right? Women start more businesses than men actually, but they tend to be freelance businesses or, you know, you might be an independent hairdresser, you mm. might be somebody that's running something while you're trying to juggle kids and all that stuff. So they're small businesses, they're entrepreneurial small businesses. And yet women aren't represented in the entrepreneurial community of businesses that mm. scale very much and their talents seem to get sort of set apart from other people's. It's just a, a weird anomaly. When I went into Parliament, Parliament sort of, I thought, well, you know, it's going to be a bit strange that there are not very many women, but it turns out there are more women in the House of Lords and the House of Commons as a percentage of the total than there are in my own sector, the tech sector, which I know you know, Lauren, is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently. 27% yeah. of Parliament is women, which is not enough, but 17% of the tech sector is women. And this is a sector that didn't exist 20 years ago. And worse than that, the creators of the technology, either software engineers, the ones that get paid the most money and really have the power, as anybody here who is running any kind of tech business will know, about 4% are women. So there's a lot to do. Mm. OK. Emma, what do you think? Well, I've been thinking about this on, on the way here when I was invited. And I'm, um, I sit in Westminster every week now, not where you sit, on a Wednesday doing my show in Millbank and with lots of women and men coming through the doors to talk about politics. It's a mainly political show then. And the thing I'm always struck by is if a woman gets into a position of power but she continues to play it just like the man before her, is there any difference? Mm. And so in one way, we're all sitting here and I, don't, I can't be alone. You might not share her politics, but when I saw that Theresa May, however she got there, had ascended the dizzying heights of messing up or cleaning up the mess of David Cameron, <laughs> sorry, I should say, uh, I sort of thought, I've got a woman back in charge. You know, it's sort of quite exciting, isn't it? But it's what you do with that power. It's all very well saying, what would the world be like if it was run by women? If it's run by women, but they ape the men before them and the systems that they are surrounded by, is it going to be any different? And we have to give people like Theresa May a huge amount of credit, even Margaret Thatcher a huge amount of credit, because they basically had to, have had to, along the way, play a man's game to get there. But when they get the keys, what do they do with it? And I'm not sure we've seen necessarily yet a woman really disrupt the system they've inherited. Would a, would a world with more female leaders in it be more peaceful? There are so many that have gone to war in the past, you know, from Margaret Thatcher to Benazir Bhutto, you know, I mean, what, what do you think? I think it's kind of insulting for us to think that all women will lead in a particular way and that we're not all, you know, if all of us were leaders in the room, we'd all lead, we'd all lead in completely different ways and that doesn't really account for personality and temperament and life experience and, you know, 
individual responses to, to conflict or to peace or to negotiating. And everybody, all four of us would probably negotiate, five of us would negotiate in completely different ways. Mm. Um, I think we, we are giving, you know, when we say the world will be better if it's run by women, that's, uh, you know, potentially a great prospect. But is that entirely true? I, okay. I completely agree with that. But I think the thing that occurred to me when we've been talking is, I believe, what you think, that there are a set of issues that still just get hidden mm. because men don't see them. Yeah. And so if you look at you know, one of the most depressing stats about violence against women that is just not going anywhere, and I believe that they get surfaced in different ways. And you know, Theresa May and her modern slavery bill is an interesting example of that. And so I do believe that there are axes through which more women running things of scale and substance would just surface different issues, so you'd solve maybe different, more different types of problems. I mean, this is the interesting thing. It's, it's about behaviour as well. One of the, you know, is there such a thing as a kind of female management leadership style? Is there such a thing as a male management leadership style? I mean, there are stereotypes, I think. I think, you know, there's a kind of stereotype of female leaders as being kind of collaborative and, um, you know, male leaders as being a little more kind of belligerent and they're macho and they're, you know, and aggressive perhaps. Um, is, how, how kind of accurate is that in, in your experience? I mean, what, what do you think, Karen? Do you think there's such a thing as a kind of male management it's, style and a female? It's really style? interesting because a, a lot of this is about <laughs> diversity of thought and behaviours rather than about gender. And if we think about um, the Davis report and the recommendation on the Davis report <clears throat> to have more women on boards, and a lot of companies either shrunk their boards to hit the targets or they ended up recruiting lots of women as non-execs who had exactly the same background as the men on the board. So you absolutely have no diversity of thought at all because mm. it's exactly the same sort of background and nothing new coming into it. I do think that you know the, the female leaders that I have worked with, um, that it, it's more about whether or not you demonstrate alpha male traits, I would say, um, it, it is what's important. And I know some men that don't have alpha male traits, who are fantastic leaders. So in terms of behaviours, collaboration, great. Flexibility, great. Vulnerability, great. So being Vulnerability, able to great. People yeah, might being be surprised able to that. show that you don't know all the answers and bringing in people to help you answer it. And I think that is something that a woman will do. They will show that they're vulnerable. I want to bring us back to the US election um, and what it means for women from the Trump tapes to Michelle Obama's uh, star turn, which Tazine's already mentioned, to Hillary Clinton being within touching distance of the presidency. Um, gender is, I think, at the heart of this election race. Uh, Tazine, what have been the stories that resonated with you? You've already, you've already mentioned Michelle Obama. I mean, her speech was obviously, a, I, I think, will, it, it was described as uh, by a Republican chat show host as the greatest political speech since Reagan. Yeah, I mean, all her speeches have been, if you, you know, I've just been watching one after the other obsessively. Um, <laughs> I, I think what's come out, I mean, the, what, what's defining about this election is that it really has placed women, women's issues, if you like, sort of central. And Trump is the representation of everything that's anti-women and Hillary Clinton has by default and also because of who she is and you know her own work around women has now represents um, the, the women in in all magnificent forms and it's sort of everything else is falling by the wayside Leonardo DiCaprio said we no one talked about um, you know, climate change um, at any you know the, the, the latest debates and you sort of think what's happened to these other sort of really big issues okay uh, Karen can can I ask you I mean I will ask this this question to everyone um, if Clinton wins what would what would it mean to you that they're, they're the, the first female president of um, the United States <coughs> It, it, it's an interesting one because whether or not you agree with her politics and what she's like as an individual, um, I think it's, it's significant that you have a superpower that would elect a woman. I think it's been too long. It's taken too long to get to this position where we have a female potential president. I, I am hopeful, um, but... I would judge Hillary in the same way that I will judge any man. It's about what she does with her power and how she then uses it to change things for the better. So it's great that we are looking at a woman as a potential president, but I will judge her in the same way that I will judge a man. What's she going to do with that power? Martha, what do you think about the, the prospect of the 
potentially the first female I, president of America? Um, I think she's going to have a really, really tough time. And the danger with that is then, you know, she might have a completely, like Obama has had, stalled Congress and Senate, so it's impossible to get anything of substance, substance done. She arguably will have an incredibly divided country, and post-Brexit will look at it, nothing. So then, you know, classic thing, woman has to be twice as good as a terrible man to be thought of as even half as good. I've got that wrong, but you know what I mean? So will she just face such an onslaught that she might only have one term, and then no one will ever see a woman even go for it ever again? So stakes feel pretty high, even if she gets in to try and make sure that this isn't seen as something much less hopeful and powerful. So, you know, I think it's a really tough gig, but of course, I hope that it's her. With Hillary, what could be really interesting uh, taking, I know what you're saying about Barack Obama essentially has been called a lame duck in lots of ways because he's had all his power blocked, um, it, certainly in the last bit of his presidency, is that we've never had, forget the fact she's a woman, we've never had a more experienced candidate. Mm. So I feel like she knows her way around, she doesn't need the tour of the White House, <laughs> Bill can just amble in. Like, it would be really interesting because she knows how the levers work and she must have been thinking, we hope, about innovating it. Okay, doing it differently to Bill. I mean, there's no one who's got this kind of insight, never mind uh, being <laughs> First Lady, being a Secretary of State. So if she gets it, the thing I'm really excited by, potentially, is what she'll do with it. And I think we've got the best possible chance of, very much what I said at the beginning, of someone having the keys to the, the best train set, supposedly, or the most powerful train set in the world, and really doing something different with it. Whether she does that, like Karen, your judge her just says, much as you'll judge a man. But you, all the, if she does get it, all the odds are on that she can do it at least with the experience without having to be new girl for the first 100 days. But the danger is, is that if she is a disappointment, it's because she's a woman. Yes, exactly. Not just yeah. because she's shit. If, you know, we're talking about the potential kind of leaders of the future. What about the next generation? How can we encourage them? Um, but we've got to start really young and, and get them thinking from a very young age which perhaps our generation didn't get a chance to think of our, ourselves in these positions of power. If that pipeline needs to start at that point, rather than once they start to, in their first jobs or, or once they get into sort of um, middle management. If you start younger and get kids, you know, you can indoctrinate kids to believe in anything. So if you're indoctrinating children, <laughs> young girls, that they can lead, lead, lead the world, they can be, you know, they can be uh, at the top, the top levels of their organisations, then why would they believe that that's something that's within their grasp? Thank you so much for a fantastic panel. Thank you.